So hello, my name is Roman, and uh, before I jump into the presentation, I actually have to warn you about a couple of things. Well, first of all, this has probably very little to do with big data. So I tried to convince organizers that it actually belongs to the community talk, but they told me, no, you get way better attendance if it belongs to big data, so here, here it is. Um, second of all, it's kind of an interesting uh, talk because it was supposed to be delivered by three people, two of them bailed, so like it's just me. So it was supposed to be three times bigger, but you know, you'll see. And then it's, it's kind of like an open conversation, really not even a talk, so I'll try to you know, provide some common themes, but I really, I'm, what I'm really interested in is your feedback. I'm really interested in, you know, turning it into a little bit of a powwow because it, it is, I'm promising you lessons. I'm, I do not promise you any solutions. I don't promise you any sort of lessons learned. See, it's not, it doesn't say that we learned any lessons. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I'm sort of a pretty old school Unix software developer, you know, participated in, you know, couple of open source projects. Hadoop guy, you know, since 2009. Um, Apache Software Foundation incubator PMC, you know, so Big Top it was the first project that, you know, I sort of took through the PMC, uh, through the uh, incubator. And I kind of like that experience so much that, you know, I'm now trying to help all the other projects. So if you have cool, awesome ideas in the area of big data that you would like to bring to the SF, please talk to me. Uh, and I'm VP of BigTop, Apache BigTop, now that the BigTop is the top level project. Uh, what is Apache BigTop? So before I actually jump into all these things that I wanted to talk about, uh, let me give you what's, what's on the resolution of the board when we graduated. It's kind of a mouthful. Uh, when open source software related to a system for integration, packaging, deployment, and validation of big data management software, distribution based on Apache Hadoop. So what does it really mean? Well, what it really means is that, you know, those of us who remember how Linux distributions used to be would recognize this picture, right? Because if you remember, like, you know, I, I, I think I discovered Linux in, let me think. So that was 95, I think, uh, 94 maybe. And it was cool because it was basically a bunch of floppy disks, right? You know, and at the time I had an access to a Spark machine, you know, in my at my university, and like I cross-compiled my kernel. That was my thing, you know. I actually wasn't to compilers, you know, to begin with, and so I, you know, made a cross-compile and cross and it didn't, didn't work. And then I put it on a floppy, and it's like it's so cool. And I actually almost built my own distributions because that's what everybody did at the time. You know, you compile your kernel, you compile your dynamic linker, you compile your glibc. All of a sudden, you can have Bash and nothing else, but at least there's Bash and, you know, you go from there. But then it was kind of interesting because uh, I sort of discovered Slackware, but immediately, somehow at the same time, I also discovered Debian. And Debian was super cool because all of a sudden I realized that, you know, this nicely packaged software uh, that I used to uh, love because Sun was everywhere, you know, at the time at my university, it can also be done on Linux. I mean, there's, these are the guys who actually have, there's like no commercial support. I mean, it's just like uh, Ian Murdoch and his wife, Debian, Deb and Ian, right? And they've done it, right? You know, they essentially took all of the GNU software, you know, paired up with the Linux kernel, which is an idea that somehow escaped Richard Stallman for so long, uh, put it into Debian, and all of a sudden this, you know, panopticon, this plethora of Linux distributions, you know, appeared, right? Now we have like, Ubuntu, we have Nopix, we have, you know, damn small Linux. If you look at, into the derivatives of uh, Debian, it's a huge list. And again, I'm only giving Debian as an example because it's my personal story, but, you know, the same thing could be traced, you know, through Fedora. I mean, it's essentially the very same effect. So what BigTop is trying to do, BigTop is trying to do to Hadoop what Debian or Fedora, for that matter, did to Linux. Uh, we're essentially trying to define a 100% community-driven open source, you know, Apache through and through, uh, distribution of big data management software. And we are hoping that, first of all, all of the efforts that are now, you know, spread through community of making it possible, making it happen, would be focused on BigTop. And it will mean that vendors, you know, Cloudera, Hortonworks, you know, uh, EMC Greenplum, uh, will actually have a much easier job to do. They will only have to focus on the use cases that are important to their customer base. Because let's face it, I mean, vendors are really efficient at knowing what, they custom, what their customers want. I mean, that's why customers typically pay them money. Uh, 
And it doesn't make any sense to reinvent that wheel every single time, right? You know, like coming up with your own distribution just because you can, like, you're essentially fracturing yourself, you know, the community is not that big, and it's, again, it's, it's not great. So, um, if you think about, you know, what Big Top is trying to provide, what is really missing, right? You know, what was really missing back then, you know, in the good old sort of Linux days? What is missing today? Well, what is missing really is a platform view, right? You know, an Apache software is great about, you know, providing you with really cool building blocks, uh, but there is not necessarily an agenda in the ASF to provide you with a platform view, right? Uh, and I put it, you know, sort of a little bit maybe whimsically, it's a generalist yin to, for a specialist yang, right? You know, like we all developers, we like being specialists because that's what drives us, you know, that's what makes it so cool, right? You know, we go to our next job interview and like we are Hive developer, right? We really know our stuff well. But what's missing is, you know, this generalist view that is typically present in the, you know, DevOps communities or, you know, system administration communities. It is typically missing, and again, it's not something that ASF is actively uh, uh, fostering. Uh, also, shared community-driven use cases. Again, you know, Hadoop people kind of sort of know how HDFS and MapReduce are used, but they really have no clue what things Giraffe guys are struggling with them when they're trying to use Hadoop, or, you know, Uzi is a great example, because Uzi has like 11 fingers, and, you know, each finger in every pie, so, you know, Uzi can drive pig, and, you know, hive, and talk to HDFS, and, like, the kind of troubles that these guys have go through, they're just enormous, and there's no place for that to be shared, right? So we need, to, we need that shared repository almost uh, of use cases, best practices, and upcoming standards to some extent, right? Again, I keep coming back to this uh, Linux example. If you look into Linux, uh, Linux wasn't really laid out the way it is today from the day one, but at some point there was file system hierarchy standard that appeared, you know, there was a Linux standard based LSB. Is it perfect? No, absolutely not. You know, I, I cry every single time I need to like depend on an LSB component and then I discover that, you know, a particular distribution would like drag, you know, the entire printing subsystem, you know, just for me to depend on something that has to do with like, you know, you need D management scripts. And I'm like, oh, why did you do that? But at least, you know, at least there is some kind of a standard. I mean, at least I, I can depend, like, yes, it drags tons of crap, but like I can depend on it. Uh, and it actually has to be integrated with just about anything, right? So, again, Apache software is nice in the sense that it kind of gives you a building block, but it doesn't give you a lot of uh, understanding right away of how to integrate with the base operating system, right? So, like, if you're running Linux, well, maybe there is upstart and system D. If you're running Solaris, well, there is system, you know, a service management facility, SMF. If you're running on Windows, well, God knows what they do there, right? So. It's like there is no that view, where does that functionality belong? And I would argue through this talk that it actually belongs to something like Big Top. So when I, when I think about ASF, I mean, ASF community, that's what I have in mind, right? It's like, it's not just bizarre, it's bizarre bizarre. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, you have like, you know, this would be like, I don't know, this is like a Hadoop tent, right? And, you know, near Hadoop tent, like, it's not really Hadoop tent because it's like, you know, HDFS and MapReduce and Common, and you cannot really separate them because, you know, you can't, but they are really separate, so, like, somebody needs to, like, drag them apart. But the crowd is so large again, you know, like, surrounding them that you cannot really, so, like, this is, this is what I have in mind. What I'm trying to argue is, you know, we don't have to turn it into a cathedral, but maybe we can turn it at least into something like this. I mean, it's a little bit like more structure. I mean, people understand, you know, that there is an alleyway where you can, like, get vegetables, and there is an alleyway that, when, you know, you can get bitten and you don't go there. So, you know, we can try maybe something like this, right? Uh, it's even better because, you know, everybody understands that it's open on Sundays. It's, uh, you know, it's working from like, you know, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So there is a predictable release schedule. So, you know, vegetables get released on a schedule and it's a train model. So, you know, like, you know, nobody's waits, you know, for carrot to, you know, mature. It actually gets delivered on time, you know, every single time. But some people say that maybe we'd need to go to this model. Uh, well, the difference actually here, you know, it's not that gr great. And, you know, to a casual observer, it seems like it's almost the same, but to me it's not. So to me, and I, I, I love Whole Foods, I mean, I'm like, I, I shop there every single time, you know, Trader Joe's doesn't have my item, but, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, the difference between 
this one and this one, is that this is a vendor-driven business, right? You know, these guys kind of have an agenda. And John Mackey is actually pretty open about his agenda. He wants to influence the world for, through me, right? You know, like, he has that agenda and, you know, like, today, uh, I am a happy customer, tomorrow, who knows? I do not have any participation. Like, there is no, you know, form that I can fill out and tell John Mackey, like, here's how you need to run your whole food, whole food business. I can vote with my feet, you know, I can spend my money elsewhere. But I think, you know, we really should stop here. And we shouldn't be really even tempted by the idea that there will be all these guys, you know, all these vendors who will fix this problem for us and turn these, you know, bazaar from the, you know, picture number one into Whole Foods because it's not really great for our community. We actually have to build that place, that sort of like marketplace of ideas ourselves. And then vendors absolutely should profit from it, right? You know, without vendors, uh, it won't be a complete picture. Vendors are as part of the, vendors are people too, right? You know, they're as part of our community as anybody else. So I keep, I keep bringing up this point of you know, using uh, ASF software. Well, if you think about it, and I think even if you go back to the uh, uh, formal definition of what ASF is as a non-profit organization, at the end of the day, ASF is the business of producing tarballs. That's what ASF does. We can be misled by the fact that you know, sometimes there are like binary you know, things in the tarball, and those would be called binary convenience artifacts. But really, what ASF does and it was set up for is producing a tarball. So one way of using, actually the only way of using an ASF software would be this, right? You know, like, imagine that you wanted to have HTTPD. So, well, you get a tarball over the release, hopefully. You untar it, you know, you configure it, you make it, you try to install it, you get an error, nothing works, you know, you're frustrated. And you finally, ah, uh, screw it. You know, I don't care about the version. I'll just type, you know, sudo apt get install httpd. At least it's well integrated with my Ubuntu system. And it kind of is, because when you do that, it actually nicely asks you about, like, hmm, gee, I noticed some configuration files in your file system. Would you like to keep them, or would you like to get the ones that are coming from upstream? You feel like you're being taken care of, right? And again, it's not really an ASF's fault. There is nothing fundamentally that ASF even could have done. It gave you the set of building blocks, and it happens to be that there was a vendor who was willing to take that set of building blocks and turning, you know, to, to turn it into a distribution. Uh, but ASF fundamentally is not in the business of producing a distribution. So an ultimate way for me uh, to use Hadoop would be something like this, right? So there is uh, Hadoop, after all, is a distributed application, right? So I mean, you can app get install something, but it's not really what it's all about. So I would actually like to be able to like big top launch cluster, you know, dash dash config, you know, HBase and get a fully functioning HBase cluster. Oh, and by the way, in that template, I would also specify what kind of like operating system, you know, it would be, right, you know, and that integration between the HBase packages and all the rest of the Hadoop ecosystem would be, you know, and the operating system would be taken care of. Uh, people actually ask me, Maybe I'm misled. Maybe we're there already. I mean, work kind of does that, right? Well, yes, it does, uh, but not really that. It's not what really I'm talking about, right? Because what WAR really helps you with, I mean, WAR is essentially a development tool, right? You know, it's again, it's part of that ethos of ASF to, you know, provide you with as many useful building blocks as possible. And WAR is an absolutely cool, useful building block. It's just it's not a building block that I can, you know, successfully give to a DevOps person, right? A DevOps guy fundamentally has a very different view of the system. It's a system view. It's a sort of generalist view where Word slings, you know, jar files, you know, back and forth. Word really knows, like, you know, where tarballs are, you know. It's all these developer-oriented details that we take for granted. But anybody who is coming to our community you know, from, from elsewhere, it would be as silly as you know, expecting anybody who is running a Linux system understanding what dynamic linking is, right? You know, like you just, I mean, you have to abstract it away if you want people to use your system. So what are the key challenges? I mean, what separates us from what we have today uh, and, you know, this ultimate ideal picture of just running a big top command, a single big top command, and getting a cluster. Well, I'll go, you know, through these things one by one, but essentially, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big list, right? You know, we are dealing with a really diverse set of components. 
and I'll go into that in a minute, but let me cover the other ones first. So it's a high churn APIs. You know, Linux is a good example, but to a point, because with Linux, uh, at least the APIs, you know, arguably, uh, were fixed long before Linux even appeared, right? So we had POSIX, you know, long before Linux appeared, and no, Linux is not a POSIX, strictly speaking, you know, fully POSIX compliant system. But these APIs were laid out, and, you know, applications were developed to work against those APIs, and that reinforced, you know, how Linux ended up evolving. With Hadoop, we have no clue. I mean, with all this big data business, we have no clue what the ultimate APIs will end up being, right? You know, we have some understanding, but it's evolution. It's not perfection, right? We don't, we don't have a template for the system that we're building. And what it means is, in order to be part of this community, you actually, you really have to invest, right? You know, you really have to invest time because you cannot just say, well, uh, I have this application that I would like to develop for Hadoop, and I will never ever talk to the commu Hadoop community. Just like if I have an application that runs on Linux, I rarely talk to the Linux kernel guys, right? You know, unless I'm really into some heavy, you know, device drivers or whatnot. Like, there's no really much need for me to talk to the Linux kernel guys because I kind of know that they won't break me. Like, the APIs that I'm using are safe in the sense that, you know, it's so pervasive that if it breaks, I mean, like the whole world will end or something. So there is a presumption that the APIs are more or less stable. Uh, Hadoop is also asynchronous development cycles with all of the components, but that's again, that's not new. I mean, every single Linux distribution has to deal with the same issue. You know, your Linux kernel gets released on a different schedule from your GCC, from your X, from, you know, just about anything in the system. Uh, combinatoric explosion of dependencies, it also is not new in the Linux. Uh, but it's even worse with Java, because with Linux, it's a, you know, traditional Unix operating system, so it's a little bit more difficult to really go hog wild with your dependencies, because you kind of like depend on what's installed on your system. Uh, with Java, it's one Maven download away, right? You know, you declare any kind of dependency and voila, you get it. The trouble is that you don't know what else you would be breaking, because, you know, with Java, anything that you get on a class path, you know, through your dependency, will also get on a class path of the guy who depends on you. And then you would figure out like, oh gee, I want Guava X and that guy wants Guava Y. And by the way, when I put X and Y on the same class path, it just breaks. So all these things, I mean, uh, you really have to have a single view of the system to harmonize all of these types of dependencies. Well, I mentioned a couple of times, you know, like Maven, Java. It is after all Java based in a sense that even for that, we don't have a good template of how the system should be managed. If you look into Linux and Unix distributions today, not a single agreement on how Java software should be managed. And Java community, by the way, didn't help us either. I mean, all this like OSGI nonsense, I mean, didn't help a single bit. Uh, but it's only now, it's like in 2013, it's only now that Linux vendors finally are like, oh gee, Looks like we have to deal with Java after all. We thought it would die, but you know, it didn't, so now we have to deal with it. So let's figure out where to put all of the jar files. Let's figure out how to construct a class path. Let's figure out how to have a system that can you know, interface with Maven so you don't just drag random bits from the internet. You actually have a system view. It's only now, and again, through BigTop, I'm actually engaged in uh, Debian, sort of Ubuntu communities, you know, Fedora communities a little bit. And these are the questions that they're trying to answer. The cool thing is we actually have a lot, of, uh, a lot of advice or a lot of, you know, at least, you know, scars to show, right? So we can actually help them in a lot of ways. And by the way, that's the way that open source works, right? You know, you cannot expect them to solve it for you. Like you can actually come to them and tell them like, here are my use cases and here's what I expect to be happening. But ultimately, the biggest challenge that I see in Hadoop is that it's a fundamentally distributed application. And what I mean by that is uh, it's a new breed of an application. Uh, people tell me, well, HTTPD is kind of distributed as well. I mean, you throw like, you know, a couple dozen of them behind the load balancer and here's your distribution. No, it's not. Like, you know, it's a, you know, it's an embarrassingly distributed application. That's what I call it, HTTPD, right? You know, it is unaware of its surroundings, yet it functions like it's perfect. It's not like Hadoop is, right? You know, in Hadoop, every component knows about everything else, which is a perfect segue into what do we actually have to deal with. <clears throat> So this is a very rough outline of components. Uh, it's actually like half the components that we manage in BigTop. But it gives you some idea, right? So like this, this pervasive you know, coordination service called Zookeeper. You know, there is obviously HDFS. On top of HDFS, we have HBase, Yarn, Uzi, 
Pig, Hive, you know, kind of sit, you know, slightly in between, you know, uh, Impala, Hue is a, you know, overall UI on top of everything. Um, people look at it and say, well, gee, it's kind of like a lot, but, you know, it looks simple. Like, we understand what dependencies are, so let's manage it. No, you don't. <laughs> That's about how dependencies look like. Uh, why? Well, because it happened. <laughs> and we're in the business of harmonizing it. Um, but it's a jungle out there. I mean, this is the complete list of things that we actually manage in BigTop. Now, that actually starts to look like a miniature Linux distribution, you know, back in 95, right? You know, it's a pretty hefty list. And if you look, on, uh, look into this list, look at it. Um, there's all the Apache software, right? You know, it's great because Apache is so, so perfect that it actually provides us with all these components. All we have to do is just integrate them. Now, the trouble is that these components, again, like these, these, these guys are just, you know, roaming through this, you know, flea market bazaar type of situation, you know, throwing, you know, F-bombs, you know, left and right, you know, not really like, you know, but th there, is, there is some hope in there. Uh, but before I actually jump into the you know, content of my talk, because it's all a preamble you know, up to this point, let me actually talk about dependencies, because dependencies really get my blood boiling. I mean, <clears throat> it's an inferno. I mean, it's not even a jungle, it's an inferno. And my favorite example is Hive. I mean, Hive, you will see, would be my favorite example in a lot of these, uh, because it exemplifies the things that you know, we have expertise in. Um, not in the sense that Hive is, you know, particularly bad citizen of the Hadoop community. It's just that it has to be integrated with quite a bit. And the developers actually have a very sort of specialized view of their agenda, which is great. Because it means that I don't have to solve a problem of SQL engine on top of Hadoop. I know squat about it. I mean, like, I know my SQL, but how does it translate into MapReduce jobs? I do not want to know. What I do know is how to integrate it with the rest of the system. Now, Hive depends on HBase because it has this ability to, you know, use HBase as a backing store uh, for tables, not just, you know, HDFS. And obviously, it depends on HDFS. You know, it also depends on MapReduce. And if you download Hive 0.8.1, um, applies to any Hive. I mean, it's just a pretty good example uh, in this version. Uh, you will get a tarball, and inside of that tarball, you will get a couple of binary convenience artifacts. Uh, and there will be a lib subdirectory that is supposed to have jar files for things that Hive depend on. So here's a million dollar question. If I do ls on that stuff, and by the way, this is what Hive declares as dependencies. So like if you look at its uh, build infrastructure, which is Ivy based, so you would have to look into Ivy files. Like that's the things that it actually wants to have as dependencies. If I ls, I get this. Well. First of all, it's HBase 090, uh, 089. Like, that HBase didn't exist. I mean, I'm pretty sure, like, that was, that was I don't know, a 1st of April Fool's joke that, you know, Stack put together, because, like, that HBase, I, I, I'm not aware of that HBase. But the kicker is, it's not just one log for j it's two for the price of one. <laughs> Do you know what will happen when they appear on the class path? No, you don't, neither do I. But that's how the binary convenience artifact of Hive looks like. Again, nothing, like, it's, like, you could download any Hadoop component, and chances are these days, by the way, they would like, ah, screw it, we're not providing binary convenience artifacts because it's too difficult. But if they actually try to do that, they will end up with something like this. And the reason for that is, we don't really, have a good way of assuming a system's view. We really don't know what our hive will be used with. So I think by now, I hope, I, 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 I was you know, successful and effective enough to convince you that we at least have a problem. So by the show of hands, how many of you do think that we have a problem? Yes, my, my mission here is complete. Uh, <laughs> lessons. So. We've been doing BigTop for about uh, for about a year and a half by now. Actually, you know, we'll be pretty close to two years uh, come this summer. So BigTop went through the incubation period. You know, we are on a pretty rigorous release schedule. Like I told you, I mean, I want my marketplace to open, you know, 8 a.m. and close 2 p.m. So we're in a trained release schedule. 
we release every quarter. You know, what gets into a release gets into a release. If it doesn't get into a release, there will be next Sunday. It will open 8 a.m. as scheduled. Um, we found out a bunch of stuff about Hadoop communities, about Apache communities, about open source in general, uh, that I thought I like, yeah, I was part of the Linux movement. I know how it's done. Like, I, I, you know, I contributed to Debian. So like, yeah, I know. No, I didn't. So I'll share some of that now. Uh, my first lesson is on origins of suffering. And the origin of suffering, I kid you not, is attachment. I mean, it's, it is, because you get attached to your code. And all of a sudden, uh, Apache guys are actually very, very nice guys, in the sense that they want to help you. Like, you get a project, let's say it's Hadoop, right? Uh, and they kind of provide you the scripts for managing relationships to the operating system. You can kind of start the daemons, stop the daemons, you know, get the status of the daemons. The trouble is that these scripts have been tested on one particular system that was a laptop of a developer who actually committed the code. Nobody else tested it anywhere. And if you try to like hook it up to the rest of the system, it kind of breaks and all of a sudden you're like, yeah, well, it was a good starting point, but now let me improve it. Let me actually make it better. Uh, you go back to the respective community and say, you know, in a very, very friendly way, you say like, hey, gee, I mean, the things that you're doing with PID files, you really shouldn't be doing, uh, or the things that you're doing with log rotation, like you're doing log rotation from inside the script that actually starts the daemons. Not the best idea, because typically system administrators want to control their log rotation, you know, through system level means. And what you get back is like, don't tell me how to write my code. I know how to write my code. Like, that code is good. I mean, you're telling me that that code is crap? No way that code is crap. And I think it's a, like, you really shouldn't be attached to your code. Worse yet, you don't get to, you, you don't want to be attached to the ill-maintained code or the code that the community in general has no interest in. So there was this big hoopla, like, you know, Hadoop doesn't have packaging infrastructure. So developers, again, Apache guys, very nice guys, you know, they got together and it's like, well, let's provide packaging infrastructure, you know, so we can build Debian and RPM packages from within the Hadoop build. The trouble with that approach is that there is like one dude in the community who got frustrated and all of a sudden, you know, there is this patch that now can build packages. Nobody else in the community has the slightest vested interest in maintaining that code. That is just not how Hadoop, uh, that is just not how the ASF communities are even supposed to operate, right? You know, it's like, if your code doesn't have a vested interest in the community, you might as well take it out of the project now, because it will bitrot. I can guarantee you it will bitrot. But what I don't really understand is like, why would anybody have attachments to that piece of code? Like, I could understand me criticizing the guts of the HDFS, like, you know, don't get me wrong, like, you know, there is some attachment, right? But that code, like that code that will bitrot anyway, why would you get attached to it? You know, offload it to somebody like Big Top. Offload it to the guys who actually, you know, we kind of like run on gazillion of different Linuxes today. You know, we run integration tests. You know, at least chances are that if anything breaks, we will notice at least. Another good lesson was you really shouldn't second guess your, second guess your users. And there's a lot of tendency. I mean, like we're all opinions are us, right, you know. Uh, we know how the software is supposed to be used. But what you discover when you make software easier to be used uh, is you just dramatically expand your community. And when that happens, all sorts of people who are not really programmers, I mean, they're not really guys who write code day in and day out, they now have a way of using your software, which is great, by the way, because you want as big community as possible. I mean, that's what helps you. But then you get into a situation where they are starting to use your software in a way that you were not really prepared to deal with. And you get kind of like, you, you get attached to the fact that you had this perfect idea of how the software was supposed to use. And now somebody else is coming to you with a use case that is completely out of the left field. It's like just, dude, what are you doing with my software? If we don't embrace all these dudes who are doing weird, weird stuff with the software, uh, we don't have a chance of growing the community to the size of, let's say, a Linux community, or, you know, for that matter, even open office community, right? We actually have to allow people use software in a way that's relevant to them. We also have to allow them to have a voice 
in some type of a community that would be in charge of curating their use cases, that would be in charge of sort of helping them to get to know each other, right? And again, I would argue that something like Big Top would be such a community. You don't really want to burden Hadoop guys with every little detail of how you're hooking Hadoop to Windows or you know Solaris, right? There has to be a place where that agenda gets, gets served. Another idea that we discovered was it really is very, very uh, sort of easy to say, but not necessarily easy to follow. You want to provide capabilities, not policies, right? You want to basically, and that's actually where Apache software in general is really good. Uh, it gives you building blocks, but we should make it even more explicit, right? You know, we should admit that what we are, what we are releasing, what we're putting out is a building block that will be used in all sorts of different ways and as flexible as we can make it, you know, all the Hadoop guys, all the Hive guys, all the HBase guys, if they can put enough hooks in place to make it as flexible as possible, it means that there will be less pressure on them to fix things that break when the software gets used not in quite the way that they envisioned it to be used. Uh, and finally, very you know, easy advice. Uh, I think it makes sense and pays off for the upstream communities to focus on specialization uh, but to allow customization, right? It's like be, be a specialist, but realize that you don't know your users. Uh, next, it kind of comes you, to you as a surprise when you are trying to do good things, but they don't quite pay off. You know, people basically tell you, go away, we know it better. And at some point, you kind of have to admit, you cannot really make them do it, whatever them means and whatever it is. So first of all, don't expect common dependencies. You remember that example that I gave you about log4j, right? You can come to the respective community and say, like, let's harmonize it. Uh, you can be sort of a little sneaky about it and say, like, here's a particular version that I'm interested in, right? You know, you don't have to disclose, like, all of your reasoning. And if they're fine with it, well, you win. I mean, like, that's, that's fine. But if they are not, don't try to convince them that that is indeed the version that needs to be used, because it's not. I could bet you money that there will be as many versions as there are people trying to use software. So the version that you're arguing for is just the one that's useful to you, but may not necessarily be useful to them. Uh, and don't expect agreement on use cases. Even if you tell them that, you know, gee, let's not use log4j, let's use some other logging facility, right? You know, because again, like you have that agenda that it will integrate better with the rest of the system. All you can ask them is for pluggability. I mean, that's how open software works, right? You know, you can ask them nicely, or better yet, submit a patch to make it pluggable. You can't really tell them how to use it, right? Their community is their community. Just as much as they cannot tell, you know, the guys in Big Top, that you know, there has to be a certain way of using Hive and that's it. The reverse is true as well. And as I said, don't ask, offer. I mean, offer patches. Patches are way easier to argue with than ideas, random ideas on the mailing list. And patches, I mean, by and large, the kind of patches I'm talking about, they don't take that much time to produce. So my favorite example is, you know, a silly thing, a build system, right? You know, most of the projects in Hadoop ecosystem are Maven-based projects. Uh, so when they start, they typically are very sort of uh, rigid in the dependencies and versioning and everything else in the um, POM file. So I'm giving you an example of a Maven-based, you know, sort of project that uses a POM file and declares a dependency in this particular way. Uh, first of all, you know, first thing that you can do, you can at least make it uh, tweakable. So you can put this dollar sign in here, right? And, you know, it's a trivial change, so people would be like, well, eh, it's a dollar sign. You know, we have a property that is defaults to the, you know, uh, value that we expect. And if people want to tweak it, eh, so it's fine. Yeah, yeah. not a big deal. Uh, next line. Optional is true. It means that, yes, you want this dependency for your project, but you really don't. Because you know, the reason the dependency is there is because you want to be as self-contained as possible for things like, let's say, unit tests, right? So HBase, just to give you an example, depends on HDFS. So HBase obviously needs to run unit tests on top of HDFS and needs a particular version of HDFS. But anybody who depends on HBase might not necessarily need the exact same version of HBase, uh, HDFS. Even HBase itself 
sort of like that particular version could be different. It's just what they use in their project. If you want to build artifacts that are specifically designed to work with certain versions of you know, components underneath. So again, a good example here is HBase. HBase depends on HDFS, uh, but HDFS these days comes from two flavors of Hadoop, Hadoop 1 and Hadoop 2. There are slight, sort of, I wouldn't call it incompatibilities, but there are slight differences that are relevant to HBase. So you actually have to recompile HBase two times, one you know, to work with Hadoop 1 and one to work with Hadoop 2. And today, if you go to Maven Central, the only version of HBase artifact that you would find has been compiled with Hadoop 1. If you were to pull that artifact you know, from Maven and use it in a project that depends on Hadoop 2, you will fail. So the way to go around it is, well, produce two versions of HBase, right? You know, help them, help the respective community be flexible enough, and that's where this idea of a classifier might come, come in handy. Help them publish as many artifacts as you can. Don't tell them, like, don't, don't just, you know, go and tell them, offer them something. So embrace the synchronous nature of the software development cycle. Uh, don't expect flag days. Don't expect that everybody will catch on to the next version of Hadoop you know, every single component that sits on top of Hadoop will have a release just in time, you know, for the next Hadoop guys, you know, for the next release of Hadoop. Don't expect agreement on releases. And do practice what we've come to know as less known good build, uh, which tells you that there were a lot of Russians involved, if you look at the acronym. Um, but it essentially means that you start with a stable version of a set of components, that's what Big Top manages. And then what you do next is for the next upcoming release of every single component, you take a stable core right here, and you replace just one component in it because you know that this thing was tested the hell out of. So if anything breaks in that picture on the right, you, it probably at least gives you a hint that you need to start uh, looking into the component B, and maybe it will dis you know you will discover through the process of you know elimination that it is actually incompatibility in something else. But at least you know the entry point. So if you have a stable stack or a stable distribution, and you want to rev up a single component, just rev up a single component, even though you yourself know that by the end of the day there will be a flag day where all of these guys will have to rev up. So you will end up having a distribution with B22, D44, C33, A11. Uh, Do it independently. Uh, practice a less known good build, change of, the, you know, change of the one component, and you can pull that component out of a trunk or a branch of the stuff that the guys upstream are working on. You don't even have to tell them. You will tell them through the magic of Jira. You would be like, gee, guys, you know, all of a sudden this stuff breaks. And it was like, thank you, because you know, that's a feedback that they can actually do something with. And finally, that's, that's, that's the final lesson that I would like to share with you. Make yourself indispensable. You know, first of all, be nice. I mean, like, we are all here to work on the Apache software. Let's just admit it. I mean, like, yes, we have, you know, certain affiliations and certain likes and dislikes, but let's check it out, you know, at the door. Let's just be nice to each other. Uh, do provide glue code. So if you're working on an infrastructure or you know, integration project such as BigTop, a glue code is really important because that is something that you can give to other people and say like, gee, I just made your life easier. All of a sudden you can launch a cluster with a single command because my glue code makes it possible. Do provide tons of automation and I'll give you a little bit of a demo uh, you know, on that. And do provide missing testing. I mean, these are very, very crucial ideas because testing is the currency in the open source that you can bribe other people with, right? You know, all of us, we all are developers. We hate testing. Yet, we love the feedback that we get from testing. So there is this dissonance, right? You know, like we, we, we don't really like to do it, but we'll love when somebody else do it. So the best thing that an uh, integration project can bribe upstream with is integration testing. Uh, and by all means, it doesn't mean when I say that you don't have to tell them about the fact that you are you know, testing them. It doesn't mean that you really don't have to talk to them ever. Do participate in the upstream communities because that's how you can influence what happens in there. You cannot guarantee that it will, but at least you will have a voice. 
So on the note of uh, testing on automation, let me actually show you uh, what we do in BigTop. So in BigTop, we have a Jenkins, which is you know, continuous uh, integration infrastructure that essentially builds the next release of BigTop you know, continuously, so it's called BigTop Trunk. It builds all of the components. Uh, finally, it produces the repositories for uh, all of the Linux operating systems that we depend on. So these are actual repositories that you can yum install from, apt get install from, zipper install from, you know, just about anything. Yes? Oh, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. It's better? Mm -hmm. uh, better yet, we actually use those repositories ourselves. Uh, so you will see that we run, you know, package tests. Uh, so these are tests that are designed to, you know, uh, exercise the entire distribution of BigTop that we've just built every single night. And you would see that, you know, we have a few of them failing right now, uh, which we will fix, hopefully. Uh, we, also, we also provide uh, things like VMs. Um, do, 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 do. Let me see. Bookkeeper. Yes, right here. So again, because it's all automated, it doesn't cost us anything, right? The only cost there is involved is actually we are running it on EC2, and that's a you know, sticking point between sort of like what I would like to do with Apache infrastructure and Apache infra team, because we are very special in the sense that we are in the business of spinning VMs constantly and you know, getting different Linux distributions available to us. Apache Infra team is just not staffed adequately to provide that level of flexibility. My only hope is that uh, now, since you know, CloudStack is part of the Apache family, we can sort of eat our own dog food and maybe have you know, the same sort of deployment of CloudStack uh, that would mimic what we are getting from EC2. But again, because it's all on EC2 and the only cost involved is you know, Cloudera being sort of nice enough to pony up bucks for paying you know, for EC2 time, uh, we can automate just about anything. So we automate creation of the VMs. So if you're a developer who don't even like you don't even have a Linux system. You have, let's say, Windows laptop. Well, at least you can get our uh, VM and test, you know, the Hadoop or uh, whatever it is that you're interested in. We're making it easier for you to get the hands on the software that we're building. Uh, so that's actually pretty much it. Um, I had a couple more slides, but let me let me focus. Yeah, let me focus on. Uh, the one that is really important to me. So if you think that something like BigTop should be possible in the ASF, if you think that it would be useful to you, get involved. So if you happen to be in Silicon Valley, we run meetups, we constantly run sort of these classes where people come to us and you know, bring us their use cases. Uh, get involved if you have a you know, uh, employer who has you know, free compute cycles available. You know, if you guys work for Amazon and you can like, sponsor us, that would be great. Uh, we need way more intelligent tests. And again, like, I'm not talking about unit tests. I'm talking about you, let's say, using Hadoop and having a particular data pipeline in your organization, which you can look at and say, well, there is not really much sort of proprietary information in there, or at least I can scrub it away bring that data pipeline to us, right? You know, we would automate the heck out of it. We will run it continuously on our Jenkins server. And you, the next time that the software gets released, you will know that your data pipeline was actually tested. How cool is that? You don't have to like, you know, guess, like, would they break me? Would they not break me? You would actually know that your data pipeline is now part of the tests that continuously run on the big top infrastructure. And because we have all these organizations now building on top of BigTop, so Cloudera CDH4 is 100% based on BigTop, uh, Wendisco is 100% based on BigTop, Trend Micro has a proprietary distribution, it's a different type of a sort of BigTop user, they don't actually sell the distribution to you, they manage the distribution internally for their own needs, but it's based on BigTop. Hortonworks, EMC, eBay, Intel, they are partially based on BigTop, uh, yet, Different class of uh, users, Canonical and uh, soon hopefully Illumos, they will be trying to integrate BigTop sort of packaging into their own distribution. So you can then up get whatever it is. And Canonical is there today. So Canonical is in the business of providing this uh, deployment automation software uh, called Juju. So Juju is actually integrated with BigTop. That, that's, that's how it works. 
Uh, because of that, I think, you know, now BigTop kind of like represents, it sort of slowly happens to be that common ground. It also slowly turns into a Debian. So it's pretty safe bet as far as I'm concerned. But of course, the choice is yours. So here's how to reach me out. I'll be roaming the, you know, halls of ApacheCon for a little while longer. Uh, with that, thank you. And hopefully that was an engaging presentation. I think we ran out of time, right? Uh, so again, if you feel like these are the things that we need to discuss, we can, you know, discuss it in the hallways. We can actually, you know, stay a little bit later and have like a meetup or something. But I'm really interested in how we can pull it off. Like, you know, these are the lessons that we learned so far. If you have things that you would like to bring to the table, please, please, please do talk to me. Thank you so much. <laughs>